You're listening to episode 81 with Dr. Tobin Redwine, Instructional Assistant Professor at Texas A&M University. This episode is brought to you by Mazar's Women of Water event. Hi, this is Aaron Tartakovsky, co-founder and CEO of Epic Cleantech. This is the podcast that is demonstrating the epic value of communication in the water sector. It's water in real life with my friends, the H2 duo, Stephanie Zavala and Ariane Shipley. Mazaro's USA LLP, a full-service accounting tax consulting firm, is proud to announce its inaugural Women of Water Summit taking place on January 9, 2020 in Arlington, Virginia. This is a dynamic event promoting industry-leading women and fostering discussions around how to enhance the position of women in the sector. The Mazar's Women of Water Summit will provide an effective platform inclusive of diverse global leadership and insights for the industry, as well as venue to open dialogue and career leadership advancement paths for women. This full day event will consist of three dynamic panels throughout the day, three water talks tailored after the famous TED Talk format, and what promises to be an amazing keynote address given by Carla Reed of WSSC Water. Topics include cybersecurity, data privacy, diversity in the water sector, finance, water reuse, and more. For more details and to register, please visit mazarsusa.com forward slash women of water summit. Other species communicate, other species conserve their habitats, other species, other species do all of the things that we also love, uh, but we tell stories. And in fact, storytelling is so pervasive that it is in everything that we do. We think in terms of stories, we entertain in terms of stories, and we also learn in terms of stories. You definitely don't need to be a neuroscientist to figure out that we had an insane amount of fun talking to Tobin. He was an amazing speaker at Catalyst 2019. Uh, You'll probably see him at future Catalysts. And he talked to us about the DNA of a great story. And you'll love this, Water Nerds, because it's an acronym. And I know that we all have an affinity for acronyms in our line of work. But the DNA of great storytelling is future. So F is familiarity, creativity, and getting people to pay attention. There is a fine balance between the novel and and what they know. And if you go too far in either direction, you'll either get ignored or people will be like, that's crazy. So familiarity. But U is unexpected. So when we make the familiar unexpected, we then create new neural pathways that get people to perk up and pay attention. T, tactile. Description matters. Adjectives don't. Universal. Uh, they talk. We talk about the Wall Street Journal method and how to introduce this, uh, the details of a story. We have to start with a big idea and a universal truth. Relatable. It's pretty self-explanatory. Talking about demographics versus psychographics. Your target audience. That your audience isn't everyone. And ending with my favorite topic, emotional. We feel before we think. Just like our chat with Karen DeBaker, we are not thinking machines that feel we are feeling machines that think so this is a super fun one lots of laughs lots of jokes lots of music and without further ado let's get to the show dr tobin redwine grew up on a farm in lasbuddy a rural community in northwest texas after serving as the texas ffa president in 2003 to 2004 he earned a bachelor of science in agriculture leadership and development at texas a&m university in 2008 While there, he developed an affinity for ugly shirts and cheesy jokes. He earned a Master of Science degree in Agricultural Communications at Texas Tech University in 2009 and a PhD in Agricultural Leadership Education and Communications at Texas A&M in 2014. What have you been doing besides go to school, Tobin? (laughs) Dr. Redwine is currently an Instructional Assistant Professor in the Department of Agriculture Leadership Education and Communications at at Texas A&M. He teaches photography, media writing, and other courses in agricultural communications and journalism. Dr. Redwine teaches and researches storytelling. Specifically, his line of inquiry examines how we identify information, how we make meaning of messages in creating audience-specific content, all in the hope that we can better understand how to tell the story of global agricultural and related sciences. Whew, you've been busy, man. How are you? <laughs> That's some nerd talk right there. That is, yeah. um, that is the nerdiest bio I think I've read. I, in- I, I love it that you said, uh, what else have you done besides go to school? <laughs> Why would you want to do anything else? Spring break forever. Come on. Exactly. I don't know. You're right. You, you've, you've gotten it figured out. I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah. You suckers had to get a real job. We so. did. 
<laughs> so I have to say that um, when Arianne first started telling me about you, it was like legend status. I don't know, just the way that she talked about this Tobin red wine. First of all, I didn't believe that your last name really was she red was wine. She was like, this is a made up person. Everyone <laughs> has had, like the weirdest names yeah. uh, I like, that I've Well, heard. he has a brother named Shannon and a sister. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah. yep. I was like, red wine, red, well, so, red wine. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. my jam. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many times I heard that in college. <laughs> and you do have to filter what Arian says because she's biased because we were roommates. So I know. We, know. Yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit. So it was, um, it was really special for me to get to meet you at Catalyst 2019. Um, and from the moment that we had our first conversation on the phone to talk about you being a speaker there, I was like, oh, I know, I've known this dude forever. Like, you just have that... Uh, <laughs> That aura about you. So we're super pumped to talk with you, uh, with you today. And um, you got the opportunity to hang out with a bunch of water nerds this past June. Uh, you know, just to throw out some some global facts here. Worldwide agriculture actually accounts for seventy percent of water use across the globe. So by default, as an ag guy, you know, you're an honorary water nerd. I mean, Ben. Welcome. The club. Yeah. Uh, but most importantly, well, maybe not most importantly, but equally as awesome, you're a fellow story nerd. <laughs> yes. Um, our friend Karen Rash said that communication not be rocket science, but it is neuroscience. So why is storytelling, in your opinion, so fundamental to any industry? Okay. So first I want to, I want to say, uh, being an honorary, honorary water nerd, that's a big thing for me, man. Uh, the, the, Catalyst Conference was such a not conference. It was it was wow, a it was a community, ever. man. It was a yes. cohort of some creative nerds with an important mission. So thanks to you guys for putting that together. Thanks for letting me be part of the team. And yes, conversations there and conversations with you guys about the importance of storytelling have reinvigorated my own energy and my own research. So uh, yeah, I'm excited about that. And that's my pitch for Catalyst. And anybody that wants to listen, come <laughs> hang. It's yeah. awesome. It'll be great. Um, storytelling is neuroscience. And so here's, here's my shot at how to explain that. Uh, let me ask you guys, what's the difference between uh, the human race and other species on the planet? What's the biggest difference between us and everything else that lives on the earth? You're such a professor. We tell <laughs> stories. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, anthropologists try to answer this all the time and they give things from like we have opposable thumbs or we wear <laughs> pants or whatever it is. <laughs> but the biggest difference between us and everything else that we share a global room with is that we tell stories other species communicate other species conserve their habitats other species i don't know mate potatoes breed, right yeah okay yeah other species do all of the things that we also love uh, but we tell stories. And in fact, storytelling is so pervasive that it is in everything that we do. We think in terms of stories. We entertain in terms of stories. And we also learn in terms of stories. So learning is neuroscience. And, uh, you know, we can connect it back to fundamentally how our brains work or that everything that we experience is filtered through uh, neural pathways created by previous experiences. So it's not just that we tell stories, we think in stories and we understand in stories, Mm -hmm. which means if we've got an important message like water, how to use it, how to conserve it, how to be effective with it, we've got to craft a story that resonates with those experiences with people's brains. So uh, yeah, water is neuroscience. It is super nerdy. And stories are more than just something that your grandfather does, even though he probably does it better than you do. Yeah, Yeah. probably. Long time. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay. So at Catalyst 2019, you spoke about what makes a good story, those key elements. So we're an industry that's heavy with acronyms. So of course, we love that you came to Catalyst armed with not just like a little acronym, but like the future of acronyms. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. So your story acronym is future and I want you to walk through um, the future. What does all that mean? So sure. first is F stands for familiarity. Talk to us about that one. All right. So that acronym is not just a, a thing that I created out of, out of thin air, even though I did reframe what we already know about storytelling to fit um, how I teach and, and that message. But to learn what makes a good story. That's an important question. And so whenever I first started in to investigate storytelling, I asked that question, what makes a good story to people in all kinds of industries, not just communications people, and certainly not just ag communications or water communications or science communicators. 
um, you know, I spent uh, some time in Nashville talking to songwriters. We spent some time with fiction writers. We spent some time with uh, journalists. We spent some time with photographers and videographers. And continually, I would always bring our research back to what makes a good story. So we base what we know not only about what we can learn about neuroscience. And I'm not that kind of doctor, so don't let me talk too far out of my element and how your brain works. I told you about <laughs> as much as I know about it already. Uh, but I do feel very comfortable in understanding how we can piece together things that people already know and some research that we're doing about stories. So that's where the acronym FUTURE came from. And as you accurately pointed out, that F stands for familiarity. Um, and so again, if we talk back to the way that we know that our brains work, uh, for a long time, since I'm in education, since uh, John Dewey first wrote a text called On Experience and Education, we've known that his, his most quoted quote says, not all experiences are educational, but all education is experiential. Everything that we learn is filtered through having an experience and then teaching our brain how to package that experience in a thing that we already know. So if we're trying to teach somebody something, that F of familiarity means immediately the way your brain works is it's going to look for a, a, a line of best fit. It's going to look for a familiar road or a familiar package to put that experience and that knowledge into. We need to use that to our advantage. If we craft stories that people are familiar with, your brain starts to say, okay, I think I know where this goes. Um, and that's just the way those neural pathways work. They're not super changeable, but when we can change a neural pathway, James Zoll calls it uh, violating a schema. When we do that, we know it's got lasting happenings. And mm -hmm. you say that on Jeopardy sometime and you sound, yeah. sound cool. So yeah. that F stands for familiarity, but just being familiar alone is not enough, right? And that sets us up for the U. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Dude, I could nerd out about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> On your slide, you had something about the CMAs. What was that about? So I mentioned that when we were asking and, and learning about what makes a good story, that we spent some time visiting with songwriters, we actually did a project um, in conjunction with uh, a researcher who is on board with the CMAs, on the CMA board, um, to like say what- award show. Right, right. Country Music Country Awards. Awards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we set out to say, what are the stories being told in country music? Because we we're trying to understand who the audience was and, and how they make meaning of some of the messages. So we actually analyzed every song that charted in 2016 on the Billboard Top 100 Country Music. Uh, we looked at the lyrics for every single one of them. We looked at who the writers were and who the artists were to make some connections from those. And really, here's what we identified. In all of those songs, through hundreds of hours of country music, and that included some good stuff and then some stuff that I was not into, right? <laughs> right. In all of those hundreds of hours, we really only identified two characters mm. that were present in every single, and that both weren't present, but one or more, one or both of these two characters were present in every single one of those songs. And, uh, you know, to be specific, those characters were the, uh, the small town fixation, the small town, you know, it's the guy that's in the small town doing the rural thing, mm -hmm. um, or the, uh, rebellious rule breaker. Right. And, and really almost not almost every single song, uh, that charted in 2016 had some reference to one of those two characters. Wow. So we see that in practice. If we frame up something that's familiar with your audience, people latch onto that and we fall into that clearly. Um, we also found only six different types of narratives that were being told, uh, in that story. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much you want to uh, get into this on this podcast, but like one of our themes was um, uh, deviant behavior. One of the co-authors of that paper wanted to call that category truck bed sex, but I don't know that that would go <laughs> I like that. well with a bunch of professors. <laughs> I connect with that. And I understand that that is like all, all country music songs. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, and so what we learned from those country music artists is that they clearly understood their audience and they identified something familiar with their audience and purposefully packaged it to their monetary gain and commercial success. Why can't we as science communicators do a similar thing? Now, yeah. I'm not saying that we all need to suddenly start doing bro country, but I am saying that we <laughs> do need to identify what does our audience find familiar? How can we use yeah. that to our advantage to reach them at their neural levels? Well, because I took you down this music path, I think it's awesome that I know you're a big music guy. When I was in college, I thought that I was going to be a tour manager for bands. So I love the fact that we have somehow still have been able to incorporate music into yeah, our man. work, even though we went down a completely different path. Uh, yeah. 
I always say that I'm a failed folk singer. When people say, what do you do? I say, I'm a failed folk singer. That's what I thought I was going to be, right? Yeah. And I still won't let the dream go. I mean, I've got a harmonica in my pocket at all times, you know, yeah. just to get... Let's hear it. So anytime I'm ready anytime. to bust in. Anytime, let's do it. I mean, I'm a failed tour manager, so we make a great pair, you know? Yeah, we we together, to get, we're we all are. one failed band. All right. I'm trying to get Ariane to I'm get me an Airstream. Dancer. I'm a failed dancer. Period. Okay, we got. Do I remember this right, Ariane? You were learning to play the drums one time, weren't you? No. Oh no, not the no. drums. The um, the, the fiddle. That you were learning to play the fiddle. That's it. That was, I just knew that was it was a an fail that I did not have, and I needed you to be in the band. Bro. No, sorry. Aww. One no. day. One day. <clears throat> Someday. One day we'll go on I'll tour, guys. Your, yeah, I'll be your dancer, but it will look. Like a little lone nut video. Yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I love that we got to see the harmonica because, well, I'm not going to give it away because should you present again for anyone who hasn't seen it, I, you, know, you never know what's going to come at a Tobin Red Wine cool. uh, presentation. So, cool. okay. Uh, wow. Bringing us back. Okay. So you gave us an amazing segue into you and then I killed it by asking you a follow-up question, but I, I remember that story from the presentation. So I really wanted to go down that. It's about yep. music, so of course. Um, but you did tell us a catalyst that when you make the familiar unexpected, you create a new neural pathway. That's a big deal. Your slide called it the art of changing the brain. Uh, how can we make that happen, and why is it important to storytelling? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I got a couple examples for that. And I can't take all the credit for that phrase, the art of changing the brain. That's the name of a great book by a neuroscientist named James Zoll. I already mentioned him once. He's where I learned that phrase, violate a schema from. Ah. Um, so when we create, uh, making the familiar unexpected means we have already identified in your brain, your brain has already identified a familiar pathway or a, a box to put an experience or a memory in. If we flip that and suddenly introduced an M. Night Shyamalan plot twist, uh, <laughs> all your brain turns on because it's like, whoa, we thought this was going in a box and it's not that thing. Everyone pay attention to see where this goes. When that happens, we get more recall. We get more lasting memories, right? You create a new neural pathway, a new jump to something else. Um, so how do we do that is to take something that we think we understand and either present it in a new way or from a new perspective or from a new light. So there's a couple of examples that jump to mind for me. I mentioned I teach a photography class um, to undergraduate um, agricultural communication students. And some of the things that we talk about are just how do you get perspectives that people don't expect. Some of our great photos uh, that, that jump out to me, one student turned in a photo um, to an international horticulture photography contest and got an honorable mention prize because she laid down underneath this thing of flowers, wildflowers, and took a picture up toward the sky. And it's, a, it's an angle that people don't see. Usually when you take a picture of flowers, you just look straight down with your iPhone or whatever and take a picture. Yeah. And I asked her about it and she said she wondered what the flower looked like from a bug's perspective. And I was like, that's weird and awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yes. So when we take something that we know and present it in a new light, our brain re-examines it and looks at it differently. Um, and if we go back to experiential learning theory um, that uh, Dewey started, Kolb, a researcher, um, has done some more modern research on experiential learning. He says that it's not just an experience that teaches something, it's reflecting on that experience. So anytime we can trick our brain or intentionally go back and re-examine how an experience fits in, we're learning, we're making things happen. So that's one example is to take something that we already know and present it in a new light or in a, a different or unexpected way. Or the other one is the, is the straight up the plot twist. Like that's a, that's a trope and that's a cliche because it works, right? Um, so the example that I use here might not be as good, but it's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm an old FFA kid, right? And yeah, so, boy. And, and frequently I would attend the FFA camps and the 4-H camps. Yep. Did I tell the story at Catalyst? I don't know, I don't but so. I want to hear it. I want the rest story. of the world to know. Okay. <clears throat> Do you guys know the starfish story? Oh, yes. yeah, you did tell that one. Yeah, so the starfish story, I feel like I heard it at every youth camp growing up. And the, the crux of the story is that there's a little boy throwing starfish into the ocean. And an old man comes along and says, why are you doing that, little boy? Look at the thousands of starfish on the beach. You're not going to save them all. What you're doing doesn't matter. And he picks up one more and says, it matters to this one. And he throws <laughs> it in. And I remember, you know, the first time I heard that story when I was like 15, I'm like crying. And yeah. I'm like, yes, we're going to change it the matters. world. Yeah. And then like a month later, I'm at another camp somewhere and I heard the same story and then the same story. And then everyone's telling the story. And then it got to some point when somebody would say, a little boy was on the beach. And I would just groan and be like, not again with the starfish story. Until one time, 
I heard somebody tell the starfish story and they began the story the same way. The little boy's on the beach and there's the starfish and the old man comes up and says, you can't save them all. And the little boy reaches back one last time with pain in his eyes and throws the starfish. And this is plot twist. And then the starfish impales the old man in the forehead and the little boy pulled a shirt over his head and kicked the old man's butt back yeah. to Sunday. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as they told me that story, I'm like jumping in my chair. I'm supercharged. They took something familiar and just went a whole other direction with it. And I remember that more than any time I've ever told a story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that unexpected, that also comes from a, a great book if you're interested in messaging um, that the Heath brothers wrote, Dan and Chip Heath. The book is called, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Book is called Made to Stick. Yeah. And they looked at what makes a message sticky? What makes you remember something? And they had a big tenant on something unexpected. And I mean, that's living proof. I don't remember any, uh, I heard that story thousands of times. And the only one that I remember is the one where the little boy went all vigilante on the old man. And it's because it was so, <laughs> so we got to have something familiar, but we get lasting recall out of it. If we flip that and make it unexpected. I have something to add to that. Okay. Uh, like an example with Ann Beck from, oh, she's yeah. with the city of Mansfield right now. And she was giving us lessons on photography um, for those of us in the public education world who weren't, um, properly trained or didn't get any kind of training, then became communicators. Um, we're also were handed cameras and said, here the city, you know, you're the photographer now. Good luck, you're the camera yeah. guy. And so she was actually a professional and she gave us some lessons and she was like, okay, take some pictures of these kids or whatever. And you take pictures. And as I would from the top down and, oh, that's cute. And she's like, now get on your knees and get eye level with the kid. Yeah, man. Like from their perspective and how much more beautiful those pictures turned out and just everything about it was award winning. Yeah. I mean, they were beautiful pictures. So yeah. Flipping that perspective gives us an it. unexpected view on something in that. that now I'm going to take not only kids perspective, but bugs perspective. Ooh, so yeah. That was cool. bugs like perspectives. That. Yeah. So while, while you were talking about this, I was thinking about uh, Greg Wukash from San Antonio water system that you got to meet at Catalyst. What, a, what an amazing human. Can we give a time out just to like, I'm, I'm using my coffee clap. mug yeah. to Greg. Yeah. We're going to great person. Clap track. Uh, amazing. Uh, so he's blessed. Bright he's red our right mentor. Now. He is. Are you red, Greg? Yeah, he's bright red. Okay. Um, yes, amazing person. And one time just in conversation, he was sharing with us, uh, uh, for the past few years, we've gone to this water innovation summit in San Francisco each year called Imagine H2O, which you met Tom Ferguson, who is from there also as well. a wonderful human. Awesome. Yes. Uh, we have an amazing tribe of folks in water. I love it. And um, so in passing, like Greg was like, you know, and then I was thinking, why do they go to this water innovation summit? Like, I don't get it. I mean, I sure it's great. It's like a thing or whatever, but I don't really know. And number one, obviously we go because they have to learn how to communicate their new technologies to the people that they're trying to um, get it into the, the water industry. But also when you were thinking about the unexpected for all you water startup, water tech nerds out there, like this is one of, this is the part of the acronym that really speaks to what you do because stuff that you do is the unexpected. Like I thought about our friends uh, at Epic Clean Tech, where most people in our business think about only the centralized way of treating, uh, of treating waste. And they're like, nope, there's a different way to do it. Um, we can do it by this building. And they have like this whole like poop story that's fantastic and unexpected. Amazing. And then, you know, I'm thinking about our friends at FredSense who are teaching bacteria how to detect water pollutants, you know? And like, I'm just thinking of like bacteria that most people think are bad and I'm picturing them with little pew, 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 like fighting like <laughs> pollutants. I don't know how they, they've turned bacteria into like their own stormtrooper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean like these are amazing stories that are just outside. They're the unexpected of what we think of how we treat waste, of what we do with the waste of you know, just all of them have this story. So, hey, water tech nerds out there, think about the unexpected and how you can like Use Lunch that story that, to yeah. talk about, you know. Keep, keep you bet. Doing, you bet. So. And also, I will forever think of bacteria as having small assault weapons. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> happening. There's <laughs> a battle <laughs> being waged in my body right now in a galaxy yes. far away or something. So. <laughs> yeah, I love yes. it. Yes. <laughs> oh my Thanks God. for that, dudes. You're welcome. Okay, T. T is for tactile. And this reminded me of the conversation we had with our friend Duke Greenhill in episode 65. Shout out. Duke 
Um, he's been in the ad world for decades and now teaches at SCAD, which is the Savannah College of Art and Design. Art and Design. Yes, thank you. And he talked about triggers and using things like your senses to resonate with your audience on a whole new level. So like I thought about the Corona ad where they just, you all you have is a bottle of Corona on the beach and you just hear like the sound of crashing waves. Like that triggers me. Yeah. So, so <clears throat> what does tactile mean to you in terms of story and why does description matter but adjectives don't? Yeah, so now we're going to bring up the writer nerd in me. Right? So, that word tactile, um, you know, by definition, it means like something you can touch. It's something physical. M maybe tactile, uh, we could maybe substitute that with it's got to be tangible. It's got to be concrete. Ah. Uh, I was giving this talk to some students one time, and I said, um, what's the opposite of concrete? And a guy said, a dirt road. And I was like, well, that's how you know I teach in Texas, I guess. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I said, or abstract, right? The opposite <laughs> of abstract. <laughs> so oh, my God. Is that my brother? Between abstract and tactile or tangible or concrete is that an abstract idea is something like, you know, love or peace. That's hard to communicate. Mm -hmm. But a tactile, concrete thing for peace is an empty beach and waves and we can so when we see that ad we can hear the waves we can feel the sand the graininess of it you know anytime that the sensory part of our brain is activated we're going to get lasting recall again and we're going to make make physical sense of an intangible idea so that's the tactile element now that's harder right it's easy to say okay think about something familiar how do i make it unexpected but how do we make a story how do we make words which are themselves intangible, how do we make them tactile? Mm -hmm. um, so one way is through sensory language, as we've talked about a little bit, but the other way, this comes in anytime we're using description, and I also equate this to photography as well. Frequently, people think if we're going to be more descriptive, if we're going to be more tactile, we just keep adding adjectives. Just throw some commas <laughs> and just keep adding other words to describe it. And I tell my students all the time, you don't need more adjectives, you just need the right one. Mm -hmm. And more than that, you might not even need an adjective. Mm -hmm. The meat of our communication is in our verbs. Mm -hmm. If we can use action verbs, if we can use meaningful verbs and tactile verbs that have concrete behavior or action, that's where our brain starts to say, oh, I'm in this. I can see this happening. And that's other parts of our brains are turned on and we get into that story. So it needs to be tactile. And then you know, I mentioned that comes in, in photography, that comes in videography. If we can create shots that have like texture, if we can create images that look like they feel an interesting way, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to pay attention to those. Uh, I run an eye tracking lab uh, here at the university. And so we show pictures to people and we see where their eyes go when they look at those pictures and those videos. And they might not always come back later and say that uh, the picture of the wood grain was their favorite, uh, but they do look at it longer. Mm -hmm. And that shows us that the cognitive load is higher. Their brain is paying attention more. Um, so that's got some interesting implications that we're still trying to work out. We're still trying to figure it out. So I'll, you guys have me come back in a year and I'll have some new crap to make totally. up and talk about. Love it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, ultimately all that comes back to tactile phraseology and tactile engagement with our brain matters. And how do we do that in words and in images? There are some strategies there, but ultimately we want to make you feel like you can feel it. Mm -hmm. Can I put you on the spot? Hit me with it. Okay, can you give me like a quick example of adjectives versus verbs? Like instead of saying la 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 la, you could have said la 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 la. I teach a, a feature writing class and the first assignment that I give those students is to write a critical review of an art form. And since I love food and I love music, they do a restaurant review or an album review. And so it's common for a student to come back after they went to the new taco place or whatever um, and they'll say, uh, I ordered the fish tacos, they were good. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, what's good, right? Yeah. You know, I, I think peanut butter is good, and I think that okra is good, but I don't eat them together, right? What's good? <laughs> good relative. So be more descriptive, and I'll purposefully be vague. And mm -hmm. they'll be like, it was good, comma, tasty, comma, salty, comma, and delectable. <laughs> okay, you just added a lot of freaking words, and I know nothing more about what you said. Yeah. Then I'll say, look at that sentence. It was good. What's the verb in that sentence? And they'll look at me like I have something growing out of my face. And eventually they'll point at the word was. And I say, what does the word was mean? It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything at all. If suddenly we give action to that sentence, right? Where um, 
the tacos steamed with heat from the oven. Suddenly our verb is steam, and we have this tactile sensory emotion to get plugged into. That's way more descriptive than it was good, you know? Yeah. So, uh, frequently verbs can introduce more tactile senses than adjectives or adverbs can. I want that to eat. So good? now I want tacos. Tacos. So yeah. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm open the next hour. Let's go. Also, in on your slide, you had something about Gladwell, and you talked about. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about Malcolm Gladwell, specific. Yes. Yeah. One? Okay, let me ask you about that. Okay, so I also know that you mentioned one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell. Talk about him and spec specificity of sad songs related to tactile. Yeah, so I am a Malcolm Gladwell fanboy, uh, big time. I, I have I have listened to every episode of his podcast. Oh I've gosh, read almost all of his books. Uh, so I'm a big fan and, uh, I do specifically remember an episode in his podcast, Revisionist History. He wanted to look at, um, why, and again, this goes back to country music, weird, but he wanted to look at why, <laughs> uh, sad songs can be commercially successful in country music, but not in other genres. Why is it you don't ever hear any sad hip hop songs that are successfully, <laughs> you know, received. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's always some exceptions to those rules sure. and he kind of ignores the whole genre of blues altogether because that's all that is. Right. Yeah, uh, blues. Right. So he went to look at what's the difference between like rock and country. Why is it that we have a lot of sad country songs that are always successful and we don't see it in other areas. And so he really said it's in the words it's in specificity. If mm. you look at George Jones, he stopped loving her today. There are specific descriptions of scenes and environments. And if you compare that to something like every rose has its thorn, it's just like this generic intangible analogy. The nah. specificity of the description of a specific thing, we like it. Yeah. Our brain likes it. And also an emotion like sadness or an emotion like fear or an emotion like excitement those are tactile things, right? right? And it's hard for us to describe them, but our body knows what it feels like when we feel them. Yeah, so, we can't, can't control the tears that well up after we hear that and just... That's right, man. That's right. So um, what I learned from Gladwell in that moment is that uh, specificity matters in communicating in a song, but also in everything else that we do because it helps us be more tactile. Can mm. you say that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm serious. Like, we... We had was it 2017? The year of 2017 was our the, our word of the year was specificity oh. because <laughs> it it hit us so hard in every turn like we were not specific enough about one thing and now I mean it was a great learning lesson for us like literally everything in that year was like specificity specificity and it's a fun word to say too right specificity specificity and so we. Think about Which that. I get mad so, when people say specificness. That's not a freaking word. Come uh -uh, on. Get out of here with that specificness. <laughs> Whatever. That's just lazy. Yeah. yeah. So we think about that all the time, like in emails and everything. Like, let's be super specific about, you know, what we're trying to get accomplished here. Yeah. So side note, and um, I know like y'all are both going to hate on me, but it's funny because when people are like, what kind of music do you like? And I say everything except country. Everything. You have country. just, this, you've just made me figure out why. It's because as a writer, I prefer more of like the metaphor. Like I love when someone can take a feeling and make it just sound like, I don't know, because that's, that's what I enjoy. And so maybe country music is too tactile for me where too, it's like literal huh? too i my too woman specific. left me i went to the store i got some cigarettes and a drank a beer and cried with my dog and i'm like can you give me more than that I'm like, like I just, <laughs> yesterday i get you and instead you want i drew a line and it was yellow what does that mean right but i would like, know what it meant that's cold play yellow yeah yeah <laughs> exactly so i get it thank you now i understand i have a reason there now there you go because it's not specific with music because i'll dance to it all day i love it but like i can't listen to it yeah, and I'll also say, you know, if we're going to sidetrack and just talk about music taste. Uh, so we've done some research with country music because we've got uh, some connections uh, uh, to the music industry from former students and from a fellow professor at Texas A&M, Dr. Billy McKim. Uh, but I'll also say that that's not always my jam. I think I'm really into some folky Americana kind of stuff. Totally, and yeah. yeah. I would even argue that there the specificity is even more, yeah. but it's also metaphorical. Mm -hmm. It's just like 
the mm-hmm. philosophy of sadness with a mandolin. That's what yeah, I like. With a mandolin <laughs> and a banjo all there we go. day, baby. I can dig that. I can get down with that. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Tobin, so cool. you have answered a great question for me. Like, <laughs> yeah, like Unintentionally. Here we go. Now we know. Uh, uh, all right. So bringing it back, uh, we're, we're at our second year, mm-hmm. you of the future. Uh, this is universal. So you gave some great examples at Catalyst. What can we learn from Simon Sinek and the Wall Street Journal about making your story universal? Yeah. So uh, also, I'm glad that we got a T and then we could move on there. Uh, this is the other joke I like to make about that acronym. When I'm unveiling it, I start with F and then you and then people are like, where are you going with this? <laughs> so, nice. Yeah. I think that was strategic on your part. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So yeah. now we're back to our second U. Uh, it's got to be universal. Um, so Simon Sinek is a, is a wonderful author. And most people know Simon Sinek from um, his book and his TED Talk, Start With Why. Mm-hmm. And it's an awesome organizational philosophy book. Think about it if you're part of a group, part of a team. Think about it for yourself. He had a follow-up book to that called Leaders Eat Last, which doesn't get as much attention, but also really wonderful, super interesting. Talks a lot about um, chemical processes in our brain, what serotonin and other chemicals do. Um, And then he's got one chapter kind of snuck in that uh, some people overlook, but that's the one I talk about the most. He talks about anti-abstraction. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so this follows that tactile conversation we had. He, he just defines abstraction is, um, so here's an example. One example that he uses in that text, he says there are 68 million internationally displaced persons on the world right now. That's more than any other time in history. Wow. That's a huge number, right? Yeah. But what does 68 million mean? I don't, I don't have any idea. I can't visualize that. Mm -hmm. And if we lead with something heavy like that, not heavy, but just something that Mm -hmm. huge, we don't understand it, man. Wow. We don't understand it. We skim over it. We're going to go through it. Instead, and in journalism, the Wall Street Journal popular, popularized this method. And so now journalists, we teach it as the Wall Street Journal method. Instead of trying to hit us with that big, huge thing, show us one person, tell us one person's story. Mm-hmm. And once we identify with that one person, introduce me to one internationally displaced person and give them a name and describe what they're wearing and describe what they eat. Mm-hmm. Give me with the tactile, the familiar, and then the unexpected. And then I'm, I'm in on them. And mm-hmm. then you hit me with that 68 million. And suddenly I'm like, not only is this close to me, but this is, this is huge. This is mm-hmm. universal. Yeah. You know? And so frequently I'll say that an important thing for us to do to think about is we don't say what is a story about if we have our student journalists writing, I don't say what's the story about. I say, what's the universal truth. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't ask them to tell me to write about a person. I say, write about a universal truth. And for me to learn about that universal truth, you tell me a person's story. Mm -hmm. Um, So frequently I'll, I'll call it a universal truth or a big idea, you know, but then they get mad when I say, what's the big idea? I don't know. (laughs) What's the big idea? What's the big idea? A gangster? I don't know. It's kind 1920s of like, gangster? It sounds like yeah. Bugs Bunny. What do you say? I don't know. Yeah. What's the big idea? What's the big idea here? Yeah. <laughs> that's weird. Cool. I love it. I mean, yeah, that's in real uh, life. <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea with, uh, with the universality of our stories are we can get meaning from it if we recognize uh, prevalence and widespread, but only if it's rooted for us, mm-hmm. which also connects to this next R coming up, and that is... Uh, don't... If, <laughs> that is something that someone will tell me soon. And that is Ryan Romero. R is for Ryan. <laughs> uh, so yeah, another Catalyst speaker, Ryan Romero. Also he... a UT professor. So yes. wah, wah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he teaches advertising at uh, University of Texas in Austin. And he said that me, not me, me, I'm using air quotes, is my favorite topic is everyone's favorite topic. So he, um, one of his mic drop moments in his presentation was stop talking about water and talk about me because you're not selling water, you're selling civilization. And that has to do with me as a person that affects me. So R is relatable. Make it about me, AKA your audience. So thank you for reinforcing that uh, your audience isn't everyone. (laughs) Uh, Talk to us about segmentation and getting to know those audiences better through using uh, kind of like what you can gain from both demographics versus. Yep. So uh, outstanding talk from Ryan Romero, Catalyst. Uh, 
I had a good time hanging with him and talking with him a lot, and I learned a lot from him. So thanks again for you guys just putting together a all star tribe of people that know their shit. Can we mm. listen to this podcast? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Okay. I'll make sure my wife doesn't listen. Cool. So. <laughs> just like one or two words every now. And then. Yeah. All right. That's fine. I uh, mean, yeah. So so you know Ryan did a great job, and I I, I loved that accidentally without knowing about it we did cover some of the same ground which which gives mm-hmm. me faith and education all at once again but yeah. uh we both <laughs> talked about you got to connect it's got to be relatable to your audience it's got to be about me right? it's got to be relatable um and so for me i whenever i think about that relating thing if i could connect back to the idea of universality let's use that example again of internationally displaced people um one of the ways that i as a writer would try to make a universal idea meaningful and relatable is we have to look at our audience you know let's say i'm writing for um you know the new york times or somebody i might note that one of our target audiences is uh mothers women that have children right so whenever i am describing an internationally displaced person i'm going to make sure that we are describing the elements of motherhood that are then familiar to my audience but unexpected because it's in a refugee camp or something like that right mm-hmm. that makes it very relatable to them they say wow this is like me and then they're able to unlock that universality so mm-hmm. Understanding that your audience does have specific characteristics that we have to understand for our message to relate to them is really transformational, I think, in any kind of communication. Like, I've taught this for a long time. I've heard this from a lot of communicators. Uh, Our first question should always be, who's our audience? And if somebody says, my audience is the general public, you're wrong right you're wrong that you'll never achieve success in trying to please all the people like the old joke is that a camel is a horse made by a committee right everybody <laughs> brings their own stuff into it so you're, you're not gonna have that many perspectives <laughs> y'all hear that that's a that's an old professor joke okay. right? I, don't uh, know. I don't get to hang out with a lot of professors i know i mean we hear more and more but i haven't yeah. heard that one yet I, that's there awesome you go. there you go that's probably one of the only clean ones that professors tell so anyway it's also it, very uh, true yeah. You know, when we try to bring that many different perspectives into um, creating a device, it's, it's or creating a, a message. Uh, it gets confusing. Uh, so instead, now, I'm not saying that we, we stereotype or that we, we play on tropes, but we do play on what we know about demographics and psychographics. And so for anybody that's not familiar with those terms, demographics are measurable things like, you know, height, age, income level of education. Psychographics refer to uh, more intangible things like values and beliefs, um, history, uh, things like that. Uh, If we understand those things that we can use to describe our audience, we understand how to make the tactile and universal elements of our story relate to those elements of our audience. And that's how we get deep and lasting connections. So we got to understand our audience. So frequently audience analysis is always our first step before we go conduct research on an idea. We got to say, we got to know who we're talking to. Let's start there. I think that's where a lot of, especially in, you know, utilities is that that gets overwhelming. Like, where do I even begin? Yeah. Who do I have to hire? How much money is this going to be to find out right. who my audience really is? So, and I realize that like we're in a conundrum here too, because in water and utilities, our audience is everybody. Everybody yeah. does have to have water. Everybody yeah. has to. But yeah. we can't create one message that's going to connect with Yeah, the, that message yeah. then becomes just a few facts about when this next event is and that's it, you know, yeah. or what's going on in this boil no- water, you know, boil water notice and that's it. And there's no... There's nothing relatable about that. Yeah, there's like this fear of if we segment and target, we're and somehow leaving a, some group out. And I'm like, I'm not saying that you have to leave a group out or not create something for them. Just create something for them. Like make it yeah. personalized, customized, because what resonates to your point, uh, the story, the example that you gave, what resonates with a mother is not the same thing that's going to resonate with I don't know, a single 20 year old, you know, like the the different, we're going in different stages in our life, but area in point. (laughs) Um, So demographics, I feel in, for most cities, because, you know, we have a lot of folks who listen who do work with cities, you know, their economic development folks or their parks department folks may have done some, you know, it's easier to find kind of those measurable demographics like you're talking about, but do you have any tips that you can give to people of where they can get, more of that psychographic information or is that really a like you got to buy that i don't know about buying it so my advice would be this and understanding with my context this is easier to do where i am than where you guys are sitting right yeah. and that's you go, you go conduct your evaluation like purposefully evaluate find some way uh to do audience analysis research in 
asking your audience, whether it's qualitative or quantitative data that you create, but I think it's really important to do some evaluation. Maybe it's post hoc, maybe it's after you create a message to go see, get a focus group and say, hey, what, what resonated with you? What did you like about it to start to construct a profile? Or maybe it's beforehand. Maybe you can uh, connect with other utilities and city groups. Um, that is trickier. Um, mm -hmm. For me, it's a lot easier because, you know, we're at a tier one research university. All we do is go do research. So I would yeah. just say, well, <laughs> go ask, go find it out yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a, an important and interesting thought, you know? Uh, so I'm, I'm stumbling here cause I want to connect back to another point. So let me tie back to this and you guys magically figure out how to transition or put it in somewhere. <laughs> uh, talking about audiences and segmenting and some people might, this is Stephanie, you, you mentioned that some people might say if we segment our audience, then we're purposefully leaving out a group. Right. But we also have to remember that the way mess the way good messages work is that they don't stop with primary audience. Mm -hmm. So a great example of saying, if we can really purposefully target one segment, we're going to reach through our secondary audience. Everyone is this, my son, I have a five-year-old son and the other morning, uh, the first thing he said when he woke up in the morning, he wakes up and he's all sleepy headed and he looks at me and he said, dad, we have to do something to protect the pangolins habitat. <laughs> and you're I, like, yes, yes, we do. <laughs> okay. Watch that. Is he like somehow getting into your Netflix profile, <laughs> like finding these documentaries? I said, okay, what are we going to do about it, buddy? And he said, dad, will you commit to reduce, reuse and recycle? And I said, yes, I will, my boy. Thank yes, God. I will. All right, so can I hide him? A PSA on the Discovery Channel about pangolins and how their environment is impacted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And suddenly he's, a, he's an activist and he wants to recycle, right? Right. Now, somebody said, let's use this interesting and weird and cute animal on a channel that kids are going to understand. They don't actually think that my son is going to like launch a big recycling. <laughs> Maybe they did. I don't know. But <laughs> they do know that. I'm a secondary audience in that. Mm -hmm. And as a decider in my household, albeit the secondary decider, because I'm here <laughs> a lawyer, but as yeah. a decider in yeah, my household, <laughs> as soon as my kid says this, we've got a recycling bag now, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when we segment audiences, mm -hmm. we are not leaving out part of our audience. We are making our message more effective so that it can reach through other words, through other mouths, through other perspectives to hit our big audience. So we have to remind ourselves and remind our, our, our colleagues about that sometimes. Segmentation is not elimination. It's making what we say more effective to have wider reach impact. Mm, thank you. So it's not that. segmentation is not elimin elimination. Wait, hold on. Elimin <laughs> elimination. <laughs> Segmentationality is not elimination. You sound don't, like George Bush. Say, don't. Segmentation is not elimination. It's optimization of your Oh, oh that's a chance right there. Back. Add that to your song. She came back. Yeah. Let's make a mixtape. I'm ready. After I yeah. just went full George V dub on everyone. <laughs> um, okay, so last but not least, Stephanie's favorite component of life is being emotional emo kid right here emo not like me swallowing all my emotions down flogging herself when showing emotion <laughs> um so <laughs> kendall haven is another story researcher um and he told us a while back um to begin crafting your story with the end in mind and so not just the call to action what you want them to do but how do you want them to feel in the end um, so when we talk about this in presentations, we use the My Angelo quote that people will often forget what you said, what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Yeah. So we kid ourselves to think that we're mostly making decisions based on logic. So how can we use this power of emotion in our stories to create yeah. an impact? Make so a really important thing, like that we, we kid ourselves when we think we make decisions based on logic. But that is a very prevalent joke that we tell, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, uh, there, there's a very obvious disconnect between what science knows about people and what communicators do, mm -hmm. particularly science communicators. I work with a lot of science communicators on our campus who have, uh, you know, new inventions, new innovations, new products. And whenever we sit down to talk about how they're going to reach target audiences with this and how they're going to disseminate it to the public, they always begin with the relative advantage. They always begin with a, it's 66% better than the other thing. And I'm like, okay, bro, you already lost everybody. Look bro, at my pie don't. chart. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and what's frustrating about that is because like we want to think that we think, yeah, but we feel before we think. And there's, 
I was visiting with a, a fellow professor about this exact idea uh, three days ago, and he referenced a study for me, and I'm not a very good podcast guest because I don't remember the author of the study or where it came from, so it's all hearsay, but it's a good point, so we're going to say it. <laughs> and the point is this. Um, he said uh, that they conducted a study where they confronted people who had dysfunctional beliefs, people who believed something that was factually inaccurate. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, a, uh, I think the specific context that they were looking at was about climate change. Of course. And so then they present dysfunctional believers with factual evidence to say irrefutably you're and in fact it did not change their opinion it made them dig in even harder to Mm -hmm. say you know and and you can apply this to all kinds of things uh we were talking some some friends and i were talking about um anti-vaxxers you know Mm -hmm. and they were they were making this big thing to say that well, people who refuse to give their children's vaccines do so because they think there's a link between autism. And I say, not anymore. Like, people can be confronted with factual evidence about that, and it's not changing anybody's minds. At this point, they're making an emotional decision based on a, a value or a belief that they have, right? Mm-hmm. So we feel before we think. And if we're going to change somebody's mind, particularly if our in, in the function of our message is to change someone's mind, we won't do that with facts. We won't do it with irrefutable evidence unless you're debating Socrates and he's dead. So uh, we're not going to win the battle of information with facts. We're going to win it with feelings. Mm-hmm. And people don't like that. But, you know, social science, I'm a social scientist. I'm all touchy-feely. I got a pink shirt on, you know. <laughs> we wear pink. So the, the thing is that um, we have to think about how people feel. And if we can cause them to question how they feel, then we can introduce new logic to them um, because our brains are fallible and we can, we are not computers and we can insert all the information we want into it, but we still feel before we think. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have to remember that. So that means how does that, that's a long answer to not answer your question, And you said, so how do we do that? The way we do that, I ask our, our, communicators that I work with to map out their messages, whether it's a a feature story or a video, um, map out paragraph by paragraph or frame by frame or section by section or photo by photo on your Instagram feed, map out for each item, how do you want your audience to feel? Don't necessarily talk about what the overall objective is or what the communication intention is. Identify for every part of of the larger piece, how do you want your audience to feel? And if you can't come up with a, here's what I want them to feel, then I think your message is going to suffer. It's not, it's missing out on some opportunity to be effective. So start on your planning in with, think about how do I want them to feel? Mm -hmm. And then how do we make somebody feel some type of way? Uh, I say we do that through, again, integrating tactile sensory language and through implementing all of those other pieces, right? To make it familiar, but unexpected, to make it tactile, to make it uh, universal, but relatable. Ultimately those things put together to give us this human experience with information. And what is that human experience? It's a story. You know, mm-hmm. that's, why, that's why it all wraps up together. So uh, it. it's easy for me to, to get onto the church of story over here because I'm a practitioner in it, you know? So, yeah. uh, but I also really, really see the value and the power in it. In fact, you know, again, if I use my son as an example, when we sit down at dinner, I say, how was your day? He always says, dad, let me tell you a story. Mm. Right? And sometimes it's not, it's just like, we ate spaghetti. It's right? like, uh, yeah. Story bro, right? but, but we think in stories, we talk in mm. stories. We're missing if we don't use that in our communication. FYI, I will hire your son the moment he's hireable because <laughs> I've watched him grow up and he's the most um, like old soul like he's amazing. I love hey, it. that's that's the love internet it. curated version of him. He is really a, <laughs> a hellion and a, cr- a crazy troublemaker. So he might I don't be. know that I'll give him a good recommendation at this point, Arian. <laughs> I love this kid. Okay, that's sweet. Uh, this what you're saying though is so important. the The last letter is so important in the way we do all messaging in water, especially because um, we are very fact based and we always start with the, um, regulatory language that the state has provided or the EPA has provided. And the everyday person is like, what the hell does that mean? Yeah. Is my water safe? And then their feelings are almost always like, you know, they're untrust. They don't trust you. They don't understand what you're talking about. They're just skeptical yeah. like well i and think i'll say this too like we can't ignore those facts and we can't ignore the state mandate right language. we need we it ignore, we have to have those facts mm-hmm. but if we if we lead with that and we present up front with that yeah. 
it's not it's not effective right mm -hmm. so uh i'm not advocating for ignore the science and sure. just get into you know some kind of hippy dippy weirdness i am advocating for though think about how we feel first so right. that we can enable how we think yeah well i think it was really powerful when you said that just giving people just more facts doesn't get them to change their mind. It, it gets them to dig further into yeah. the, the, uh, the, f the truth that's not factual. It's not a truth then. But, but, uh, because like going to her point is that we often lead with the facts. So what we're doing is we're just creating, we're just asking our customers to dig further and further into this miscommunication or misperception. My government. I don't yeah. Trust you. And I don't so trust being able to lead with that emotion first and really empathy and kind mm -hmm. of being able to see it from their perspective. Wow. I think I'm thinking about every contentious public uh -huh. meeting or, yeah. um, you know, that that's out there, especially now there's parts of this country that are having serious problems with these emerging contaminants and PFAS yeah. and all these things. And people are like really scared and upset and coming out. And the first thing that you say is like, we're following all regulatory regulatory requirements. Uh, you didn't tell me anything about what that has to do with my child who drinks this water or me, right. you know, like, so it's just remembering that, that, Yep. And to the very beginning, remembering who our audience is yep. and that they don't live, eat, and breathe this every day. And while that may make you feel better and make all the water people out there feel better, that doesn't make the general public who doesn't have experience in that. So, yeah. Wow. And so the last thing I'll say about that is we see evidence of that all the time, whether we're researchers studying climate change or not. Like, you know, if I come home and I'm like to my wife, hey, what's wrong? Nothing. Hey, what's wrong? Nothing. Maybe nothing was wrong with her. But after the 10th time that I asked her if something's wrong, something became wrong. Like mm -hmm. I have <laughs> falsely created, instead of pulling her on one end of the continuum, I went the wrong way. I went the other way, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so right. presenting somebody with, with something counter to their belief by human nature pushes them deeper into their belief. Unless we go with empathy. You did say a really wonderful, powerful magic word there. And yes. unfortunately that's pervasive not only in science communication, but in political discourse mm -hmm. and all the other things happening around us that are that are tricky. Mm -hmm. So well let's if tell you more have stories and we'll all be better. Yeah the, we could oh we always talk about our favorite E word um, empathy. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's if you change word. your mind, you for some people that means you have to admit that you were wrong. It can't be like, well, I used to believe this and then I learned this and now I think this. It's somehow like, well, I can't I've told everyone that I believe this way. Like how mm -hmm. could I change? And I think that's why Tom Hickman <laughs> I'm not doing this on purpose, but he was another catalyst twenty nineteen speaker. Um, I think that's why I have so much respect for him because um, you know, he was an engineer who initially thought that communication was all fluff and didn't do it and then had this crazy situation happen to him, which you can hear in episode 18 and 19, and, um, and completely changed his mind of how he saw it. And instead of being like, oh, I changed my mind about that, he didn't just stop there. He said, I'm completely changing the way that my entire department runs and how we, uh, how we engage with our public. And so I think that's just so bold and brave to yeah. be able to change your mind and to do something with that change. So shout out to you, Tom. Shout out. <laughs> All right. But, oh, my gosh, I could – Talk to him for hours. Talk about this for hours. Like not only you being an amazing person, but also talking about this amazing story. You guys are nice. And as a storyteller, I can yammer on for hours. So reel me in. <laughs> Bring oh, it home. I know. Now, we, uh, we are, um, we are going to get into the lightning round though. I'm ready. Okay. okay. What's your favorite book right now that you can recommend to us? Okay. I got two. Both Perfect. of them relate to rivers and I found mm -hmm. one to show you, there it is. Uh -huh. it Goodbye is to a River. John Graves, Goodbye to a River. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. It's a narrative, but it has this great view of how do we make conversation important to a conservation important to a person, right? Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. So Goodbye to a River by John Graves is my first one. My second one is by a group of people. Um, it's a book that accompanies a documentary that's got a lot of attention lately. The documentary is called The River and the Wall. 
Uh, it's a mm -hmm. Ben Masters film. One of my former students uh, helped him produce the film and also wrote one of the chapters of the book, but the book that goes with it is called The River and the Wall, and it's about the Rio Grande and the Rio Grande mm -hmm. Valley in Texas and the conservation implications of what would happen if a border wall were there and problems and, and uh, wildlife behavior and uh, water and other related issues. Mm -hmm. And it's just a really fantastic, visually compelling, emotional journey through a, a science and political discourse happening in our country right now. So yeah. both of them are great, and it's two different approaches. One's fiction and one's documentary style, but both kind of come at the same idea that uh, we have to view uh, things like water conservation in terms of a personal element. So mm, Love it. Yeah, you are mm. a water nerd. On fire. Suck up. You just suck it up. Uh, okay. No, man, that was genuinely my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's something that you do every day that drives your productivity? I don't have an every day, but I have an every week. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I try to do it every Friday. Um, I try to write a letter of meaning to somebody. Right. And mm -hmm. so it's a fun way for me to wrap up my week. Mostly they're thank you letters. And when I first started this, I was going to do it every day. And then I was like, I ain't got time. I got three kids. I can't do something every day. Right? <laughs> yeah. And then you can take when a I first, shower every day. Only. Right. <laughs> so then when I first started, I was handwriting these letters. And then I realized I have terrible handwriting and that takes a lot longer. Uh, so anymore, mostly it's emails, but it's not just a hi, thank you for your time today. They're long. I'll spend 30 or 40 minutes writing one specific long email and it is emotional and it is meaningful. And uh, I quickly realized that those are more important to me than they are to the people that get them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so every Friday afternoon, I try to write one meaningful letter to somebody. Frequently it reestablishes and, and <laughs> I should stop telling people that because they're like, I ain't got one yet. Where are you at? Huh? <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> but, you know, it, it does good to reestablish personal connections and professional relationships. And it just makes me feel good. And yeah. I'm more productive when I feel good. And that's yeah. what I know. It centers you, keeps you humble, all Practicing that. Practicing that, that gratitude. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. All right. So um, in our line of work as public educators and communicators, we used to have people say, well, what difference does it make if I make a change? I'm just one person. Like, I'm not going like, to change the world. It's just me. And obviously, you know, we disagree with that. We think that one person's change can be contagious. You never know what you can inspire in others. So what's the one call to action that you're most passionate about that you believe can ultimately change the world? Okay, so this is a talk that I give frequently. It's been a TED Talk on our campus. I give it as part of a lecture series that I do for all of my students that we call The Last Lecture, which is also a great TED Talk in a book by Randy Posh. Um, so I, I'm... I got to be careful here that I don't turn this into a 50 minute answer. I was going to say, we're going into the Ted talk now audience. Uh, so bath this and break is, and <laughs> this is the lightning commuting, round. turn around, go back Dude, home and come back. I'll take 50 more minutes. Yeah, let's go. So this is the, this is the, the lightning round answer to this question. Uh, <laughs> two, two central values that I sincerely believe at an individual level can change the world are love and purpose. And I believe that because I've seen those two things change the trajectory of my own life. And so I'm going to give you about two examples of those. The first one is, uh, I was a dirt bag in college. I made a lot of bad decisions. I had this long, greasy hair. I thought I was going to be a folk singer, you know, it's true, folks. Yeah. A lot of self-destructive <laughs> behaviors. It was not a good spot. And then I met my wife and she never like mandated like, Hey, red wine, quit smoking cigarettes and cut your hair. But I did those things because she cared about me and it changed how I viewed myself and then I just made a lot of better decisions. So I, I tell anybody that will listen, love is transformational, man. It totally changed me. It's essential. We have to have it. It's providential. It's easy. Like it just works in those ways. So I've seen how it changed my life. The other word is, is purpose. Um, so uh, my friend Lance, he was one of my best friends in, in college. Uh, the first day that I met him, he told me he wanted to be a veterinarian and go back to his hometown and become a practicing vet. Mm -hmm. um, it was a long circuitous journey and uh, he didn't get into vet school on any of his first two tries. Uh, you know, and in the journey of him being in vet school, he and I got kicked out of a La Quinta Inn in Vicksburg, Mississippi, because he had a dog with three legs that was howling in the middle of the night, right? But <laughs> eventually, Lance finished vet school, and he became Dr. Lance T. Fox, and he was working in his hometown, which is exactly what he told me he was going to do when I, the day that I met him. Mm -hmm. He had been doing that for three months, and he was in an ATV accident, and he died. And I can say that now 
with some healthy perspective because Lance did exactly what he came here to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So after his death, I just thought, man, how wonderful is it that I had such a close friend that lived purpose for me? He showed me, he said, here's what I'm going to do. And he went and did it. And even when he got denied into vet school, he's like, screw you guys, I'm going to do it. And he yeah. did it. So I had this moment where I said, okay, well, what the hell am I doing? And eventually that's when I got back into PhD and, and ended up here talking to you people, right? So those two things, very clearly with scientific evidence, it's measurable, the change in the trajectory of my life, love and purpose did it for me. So mm -hmm. those are the calls to action that I'm very passionate about and that I could talk for a long time about that I sincerely believe changed the world. And they're not hard things. I'm not asking you to go memorize what chemicals operate in your brain. I'm just asking you to care about people and to think about what your purpose is. So do those things. And I think we're all in good shape. Now we're going to have to wrap this up so I can go ugly cry. Ah. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you. I would love to hear the extended version of that. Yes. As I know our whole audience would. So next time. Next time. Ooh, keynote. Just kidding. Um, maybe not. <laughs> um, well, again, such, uh, such an honor to get to meet you and to spend time with you uh, at Catalyst. Uh, then so great and i know that this is like one of many conversations we'll have because we have I hope so hope so so many totally. things to nerd out about yeah thank you guys for for setting up the space for these meaningful conversations i love the tribe i love the people that you're you're talking to um one last shout out that you mentioned him earlier tom ferguson you guys talked about going to the uh, innovation conference yeah i'm gonna call into his accelerator in a couple of weeks nice. so uh you guys got to give me some tom dirt so that i can uh you know you I can dog on him in front of yeah his i love it but uh you know i just see these connections that are showing up beyond catalyst and beyond uh the water in real life podcast and you guys are at the center of those conversations. So thanks, man. Thanks for being the, the central hub in this tribe and uh, way to do life well. Good job. Oh, thank you. It's just collecting all of our gems and showing them off to everybody else. There you go. There you go. We make it hail with gems. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the next elevation of rap music, right? Yeah. It's not going to be making it rain. It's, we're going to make it hail. Yeah. With Why hasn't someone gems. thought of that yet? That's brilliant. You're not the duo. I don't know. So I don't know. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Never miss out on future episodes by signing up for the Water Nerd newsletter. Found at the h2duo.com forward slash newsletter. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore h2duo. We share all of our new episodes there as well as in the newsletter. So whether we come across your feed or in your inbox, be sure to share episodes with your friends, family, colleagues, fellow water nerds. Help us spread the word. We hope you learned something new today, got a little inspired, or did something that brought you one step closer to your goal. Until next time, remember what one of our favorite quotes says, those who tell the stories rule the world.